So thanks again for the opportunity to, to share some of our work and our thoughts on the COVID research. Um, so I was alluding to the first paper that was published in the JAMA Oncology. Um, that study revolves around understanding the risk of cancer patients to COVID-19 infection. The reason for doing that, um, for embarking on this research was at the time, um, we had seen sporadic reports uh, coming out from China uh, that was the harm of the outbreak, um, where potentially there were populations of, can- of patients, um, elderly patients, nursing home patients, and cancer patients who may be um, more susceptible to COVID-19. Um, prior to our publication, there was a similar paper uh, by Liang and colleagues published in the Lancet Oncology as a correspondence. But that paper had adopted a different methodology to the study. Um, There, they basically took all COVID-19 infected patients and then identified the proportion of them in there who had cancer. Now, what we had wanted to do was, well, it gave an estimate. What by right should be the appropriate way to go about this is to look at the denominator, using the pool of cancer patients as a denominator and then ascertaining who among the actually subsequently developed a COVID-19 diagnosis. So that was the motivation for our research. And the best way to do it at the time was to look at our own hospital records. Now, again, we have been ambitious to aggregate data across different centers um, different to, to increase the denominator. Uh, but as you may imagine, um, in the peak of an outbreak, you know, certainly there would be um, you know, issues with regards to the quality of the medical records, the, the integrity of the data. And therefore, uh, when we decided to embark on this study, it made a lot of sense to just look at the hospital records in our institution where we could be confident of the patients who were diagnosed and the number of patients who actually were treated in our facility. So in the set time period from, uh, from January to uh, mid of February, and I will explain a little bit further why, what was the significance of this study period. We looked at um, more than 1,500 records, 1,524 to be exact, and we identified 12 patients um, to be COVID-19 positive. Now, um, relating to the point about a study period, um, this trans, uh, transcended across um, the time when the outbreak was first reported to when the city was actually locked down. And that led, this lockdown led to a acute drop in cases who were admitted to the hospitals. I mean, it's cancer patients who were admitted to the hospital because everyone's movements were restricted. Um, and, and then, you know, the end period of the study was when we started seeing a, the, the, the benefits of the, the, or the effects of the lockdown and the reduce in the number of cases. Um, so, so among the 1,524 patients, we found 12 who were diagnosed with COVID-19. Now, the key finding was that we estimated the risk of COVID-19 infection to be about 2.3-fold higher um, than what we was observed in the community. Now, we didn't have an appropriate control in the hospital for obvious reasons, but this was a crude estimate of about 0.79% in terms of the prevalence of the infection among cancer patients in our hospital. Now, the other thing to highlight here was when we then did the 95% confidence interval limits estimates, the upper boundary of the prevalence was as high as 1.2%. So that gave us an, an idea of the extent of the problem when we come to think in terms of contingency planning for um, streamlining of healthcare resources uh, in terms of how we should actually uh, manage cancer patients in the event that there was an outbreak of COVID-19 among cancer patients. Now, when we then dug further into some of the um, additional associations, uh, specifically the cancer types, age, uh, and cancer treatment, we found a few things. Among the different cancer types, in our 12 patients, lung cancer constituted the majority. Next, we also found an interaction between an older age 
and a lung cancer diagnosis and the susceptibility to COVID-19. Now, again, I would take the association here with a pinch of salt because most cancer patients are actually naturally older. But nonetheless, we found that if we stratify patients by age, less than 60 and more than 60, um, lung cancer patients who are older than 60 years of age um, had the increased incidence of COVID-19. Next, when we then looked between patients who are on treatment versus patients who are on follow-up, we found that actually um, about only about half of the patients were on treatment, while the other half of the patients were actually on surveillance. That means they came to the hospital for some follow-up or um, management of other sort of non-cancer issues. And that made us um, propose in a paper that, you know, clearly recurrent visitation to the hospital was a risk factor among our population and argues for robust and tight infection control to mitigate the, the risk of transmission of SARS-CoV-2 um, among this susceptible group of patients. So, so it was this um, you know, gradual sort of um, stepwise findings that led us to the few conclusions that we made in the paper. Now, one final point to highlight of, for the paper, and it could be arguable that, you know, whether there were false positives among the 12 cancer patients who were diagnosed, was that there was a large discrepancy between the COVID-2 RT-PCR um, result and the CT findings um, of the patients in our, in our study. Now, the reality remains that the, there's a huge or high false negative rate with um, you know, RT, real-time PCR testing for SARS-CoV-2. Again, you know, the assays that were used during the time of the study were the first generation tests. And the, the test you know, positivity rate may, the, or the accuracy may have improved over time with the new generation tests. But it is clear that you know, RT-PCR assays are hugely susceptible to variation in laboratory conditions, the primers, and so forth. And among the 12 patients, a large majority were actually um, RT-PCR negative, but had in fact demonstrated characteristic findings of atypical pneumonia, of ground glass changes, patchy consolidation, um, that, that goes along with um, symptoms of fever, shortness of breath. And so, um, you know, that was the other crucial finding that we had in the study that, and that also corresponded to the policy at the time from the Chinese government to, uh, and the CDC to, to actually alter their diagnostic criteria, um, especially in Wuhan, where there was an established outbreak and they had to loosen the criteria whereby if you had CT findings and you had fever or classical symptoms of fever, cough, and so forth, um, if you fulfill this criteria, even if you were um, test negative, then one would consider you to be a COVID-19 positive case. I think that uh, largely summarizes some of the um, early uh, 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 data that were indicative of the prevalence and the transmission rate of um, SARS-CoV-2 uh, among cancer patients and what were some of the interactions um, between some of the clinical factors like cancer diagnosis, the uh, status of the anti-cancer treatment, and the susceptibility to the infection. Now, since then, of course, um, you know, several other groups have taken on um, such research and have you know, published a lot of uh, similar data, um, concurring some of our findings. And you know, for, to this, I will refer to some of the uh, abstract and research that has been published or presented at the AACR virtual meeting uh, that just concluded last night uh, that really shed a lot of the experiences around the world. And some of them are quite comparable to what we have observed uh, in our JAMA Oncology paper. Um, and, you know, one obvious one was that it seems rather conclusive now that indeed cancer patients are at risk of um, COVID-19 pneumonia. I would like to acknowledge a few key people. Uh, my collaborator and my partner in crime, uh, Professor Xie Tonghua, who was deeply involved 
in the whole sort of COVID-19 crisis in Wuhan city when it first occurred. Um, he is the Cancer Center Director of Zhonglan Hospital uh, of Wuhan University. And he was in fact uh, mobilized to be the medical lead uh, who was presiding over the medical records of all the COVID-19 positive patients who were treated at the two makeshift hospitals um, that was created in a short span of 10 days in Wuhan City when, they, when, the, when the officials realized that they needed to, um, to construct makeshift hospitals um, you know, to handle the acute influx of cases during the peak of the outbreak. So really much thanks to him for the, for the tenacity to actually felt the, uh, to, to realize the importance of, of research and to share the data with the community um, out there uh, even while they are sort of dealing with the, the you know, the, the medical emergency in their city. Um, also, the co-authors, uh, Dr. Yu Jing and Dr. Wen, Wen Ouyang, uh, who are the co-authors on the JAMA Oncology paper, um, as well as all the uh, doctors and patients who continue to battle this pandemic, um, you know, really heartfelt thanks and, you know, for everyone to persevere. Um, and, you know, I, I have firm belief that we'll get out of it. So thank you for your time again.